Okay, um, various instances of contextualization. I'm not going to write this on the board. Um, it, this is page two of the analysis, so you know if you print it out, just, just look along. You might do instances of contextualization within the job situation. So you might talk, for, for example, um, I think it was the last series of videos. Yeah, in the last half, I talked about personal experience stories, right? A job might be a great location to talk about personal experience stories, right? Um, I'm going to, in my research, use narrative research to govern my, my research, uh, and I'm going to specifically be using personal experience stories, looking at two different uh, women, women's experience um, from the 1940s until the 1980s uh, in the job market. One was an African American woman, one was a white American woman, both uh, impoverished, and that could be very, very fruitful research, right? They, they share poverty, they share, they share um, gender, but their race, quote unquote, and I don't believe in race, but their race is different. And maybe that changes the experience, and that would be very rich. It seems like very, very simple research uh, um, question, but that'd be very, very rich grounds for research, right? You, there's a lot that you can pull from that information. So um, you can use the job, you can use home, you can use race, you can use eth ethnicity, time, place, gender and sexuality, socio, uh, socio-cultural. Um, so there are many, many different methods and um, places in which we can contextualize. Right? There are very many different instances in which we can contextualize um, the research and the data that is going to be a product of this research by situating it within a particular space. As a quick, as a quick aside, I just um, graduated a student, and her research was very, very interesting to me. She, um, she talked about um, spatial relations between African-American uh, lesbian women, right? So as an African-American lesbian woman at work, what is that space like? How does that space affect my identity? That same woman leaves and goes into church, into a religious space. How does that new space affect my identity? I'm the same person, but the, the space has changed. How does that affect my identity? Then I go home with my loved ones and my families. How does that affect? And then I go out with my friends. How does that affect? So, um, for me, I'm, you know, I'm always, always, always interested in any research that has to deal with space, spatial relations, because there's so much complexity. There's so much complexity behind um, space. The idea of space and personal identity formation, space and social relations, space and identity formation, blah 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 blah. Um, and not only is space important in giving meaning to the information that we're going to collect through the process of interviews, um, space is important, as I just said, in contextualizing, uh, in contextualizing the data and the participant's story. Okay, uh, let's go to number four. Number four. Number four says um, there's a process of what's known as restoring, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means. Right, the technical term is re r y i n g restoring. Okay. Um, when in in the process of restoring, the first thing that we want to do is organize the qualitative data into a theoretical framework. All right, so, uh, and I'll talk about what this means in a second. So we want to organize All right, we want to organize the data into a framework, and as I said, this is not, this is the, the opposite of a grounded theory approach. Um, we have data, we have data, and we have theory. All right, that's what this, that's what this is saying. Organize the data into a theoretical framework. The theoretical framework is going to be applied to the data, it's going to shape the data. In grounded theory, which I'll talk about many videos from now, you have data and the data creates the theory. Right, so this would be a grounded theory approach, this would be um, uh, narrative, phenomenological, many other approaches. Um, which is not to say that there, you can't do research that sort of dabbles in, a, in, in both of these. Part of the research creates new modes of understanding, new theory, you, you would use a grounded theory approach for that. And I actually shouldn't even be talking about this because I haven't talked about grounded theory yet. But anyway, um, uh, so yeah, what, what's being said is that there's data and the theory is sort of shaping. The theory is shaping the data. All right, so organize the data into framework. Establish causal links, right? We want to connect the ideas. So establish a 
establish causal links. Um, and that's, that's, that's simple, right? From one point in the story, especially in episodic stories, it doesn't just have to be personal experience stories, it can be biographies, autobiographies. You want to, as a researcher, especially if you're uncertain, if you're not sure what the causal link is um, between two points in the story, if you yourself aren't sure why the participant may, may have said what he or she said, or how that relates to the overall story, it's imperative. You only really get one chance at this, right? As I said before, with backing up your data, you want to make sure that you don't leave that that interview regretting that, you know, I shouldn't have, I probably, I wish, I wonder if I would have asked that question. You don't want to ask inappropriate questions, questions that are, that will elicit too much, too much grief. Um, but if you feel that the question is appropriate, um, and you feel that that question should, um, should uh, be included because it will offer more insight for data, then you should ask the question, right? And, and all of your questions are going to have to be approved anyway. Before you begin um, your research, your, your committee members will, uh, will, will guide you through that. So uh, establish causal links. Um, the next is to establish the chronology. Right? I'll just establish, right? establish uh, the chronology. What are the, what's the order to the story? Right? What, is, what's, what happened first? What happened second? What happened third? What I'm doing then is I am, in a sense, restructuring the story. Right? I'm taking the raw data that was given to me by the uh, participant, um, and I'm restructuring, reformatting, reorganizing the data. Right? The story remains the same. Right? The, the point of the, or, or the purpose of the story remains the same. The meaning of the story remains, remains the same. It's just the way that the story is packaged right? has changed. In um, translation studies, there's, there's, there's a saying that I think applies to this point of the analysis. And they said there's two ways to do, and I forget exactly how the quote goes, but it's something to the effect of, there's two ways that you can go about translating a story. Um, as a translator, you can translate the story for its explicit word order, right? The cat is on the mat, and you translate it, the cat is on the mat, or whatever it might be, right? You're translating it verbatim. Insofar as you translate it verbatim, what ends up happening is you lose a little bit of the meaning, right? Because you lose a little bit of the meaning, you lose a little bit of the artistry of what was communicated during the interview. Um, or you lose a little bit of the artistry that was communicated in the text in translation. There's another, and it's not better or worse, it's just, you know, there's another branch of, uh, uh, of translation studies, and, and that branch says, well, no, what's most important is that, is not that you get the words right, or the word order right, in translation, but that you encapsulate the meaning of what was said, right? So you have two different sort of theoretical paradigms in translation studies, right? Some translators want to translate and feel that translation is important um, by translating literally what was said. But insofar as they translate literally what was said into a new language, then part of, part of the meaning of that translation is lost. Part of the poetics and the artistry of the, the, the translation is lost. There are others that say, listen, well, it's not about translating literally what was said, but it's about encapsulating the meaning, and insofar as you encapsulate the meaning, then that's what's important. But insofar as you encapsulate the meaning, you lose a little bit of the literal translation. So both have its benefits, both have its disadvantages, and it's up to you to select um, what's best for you. Um, I, as a researcher, feel that what's most important is that I, I capture the meaning. Um, for the research that I do, because a lot of the research that I do isn't really date-specific, incident-specific. It's more about feeling, it's more about the emotional experience. So for me, dates, times, locations uh, aren't as important in the research that I do, per se. It's more about the personal experience that the individual has. So for me, I can go for more for meaning. If your qualitative research is very date-intensive, location-intensive, uh, um, uh, uh, time sensitive, if all of those are important in your qualitative research, then obviously you're going to want to stray away from meaning and do more of a literal interpretation or a little literal description of what you were told. She said that she was on the corner of 44th and 22nd at 5 p.m. on December XYZ, right? You're, just, you're basically just going to describe what she said. All of this, right, all of this process of, of structuring, of, uh, of uh, transforming 
the interview information that you receive from the participant into the final story is is part of this. In, uh, oh, this is a established chronology. It's part of um, it's part of this whole process, right? And it's a, it's a very important aspect of the process of qualitative research because without it, all you really have done is hit the record button and set up some transcriptions, and that that doesn't make good research at all, right? There's a lot that needs to be done. Um, to the data in order for the data to be um, presented to a community of researchers. Uh, and that's what I'm doing now, is I'm, hopefully if I'm doing anything, and I know I am, but what I, hopefully what I'm doing is I'm showing you sort of very, very methodically, very, very slowly, how we um, collect the data, right, and I talked about various forms of collecting the data. I haven't really gone into too much assessment of the data, I'll do that later assess the data, interpret the data, analyze the data, restructure the data, restore the data, um, uh, present the data, and share it with the community of uh, academicians, because that's what it really is about, right? It's about sharing the stories and your modes of interpretation with other academics so that we can have exchange um, you know, among us, right? Because I might not be doing research in anthropology, but I'm definitely interested in anthropological research. So I read a lot of anthropological research, and I use their research to sort of motivate the conceptual stuff that I do. They don't do a lot of conceptual stuff because they're anthropologists, so they read a lot of the stuff that I do because the theories that I, the theories that I write and the theories that I've discussed 